I'm really excited. I'm excited about this new series and we are experiencing something, something incredible. You know, when I was younger, I used to see, you know, about 20 years ago in church, there was so much denominationalism going on. This church and that church and this name and that church. But I just come back from KwaZulu Natal. There were about 90 people gathered together from all sorts of different denominations collaborating, pooling their money and their resources to see God's kingdom extended. Not so that a church or a leader can get any credit, but that God's kingdom could be extended. I never thought that would happen, not in my lifetime. But to see denominational walls fall down, see people coming together and just wanting to work together, seeing church leaders from from different backgrounds coming together to make Jesus famous. Isn't that awesome? Absolutely incredible. We're experiencing life change, but, but since, ever since I gave my life to the Lord, I've been absolutely fascinated by some of the major revivals that have taken place in, in, in church history. In the 1700s, Great Awakenings, and 1800s that, that literally changed Western society. And, and for all of us that have grown up in, in Western society, we are experiencing and living the benefit of what happened how those revivals, those incredible moves of God changed society. Even going back to just the beginning of the previous century, the Welsh revival started in 1904. Just amazing. It it spread throughout the, around the world and just changed the way people saw marriage, where they saw themselves, where they saw God, the moral fabric of society completely changing. Azusa Street revival, completely changing the world, still transforming the world today. So though we're experiencing so much and many of us are are experiencing the hand of God and the life of God inside of us, it's important for us to know that there is more. There is more. There's more for you and there's more for me. And so what we're gonna do is the start of the series, we're gonna be laying a theological foundation for, for understanding of what revival is, where does it come from, and what does God want to do in and through us? And so I would like you just to nudge, if somebody is close to you, family, then just nudge them and say, hey, there is more for you. There is more for you. And then once you've done that, I'm going to pray. And then as soon as I've finished praying, we're going to jump into the Word of God. But I need to warn you that you need to hold on to your seats. Because we're going to go through the Bible and I'm praying that you're going to see the Word of God in a way that's going to bring life and hope into your situation. And life and hope into the world that we live in. So let's pray. Lord God, we just want to thank you for your word. Thank you that it's powerful. Thank you that it is alive. Thank you that we're not alone. Thank you that you are way more committed than what we ever could be to see our society, to see our country, to see our family changed. We realize that we are living in difficult times. But we know that you have given us everything that we need to see the change that not only do we want, but that you died to provide. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Okay, are you ready? Okay, just grab hold of your seats. Are you ready? You got it, because it's gonna be a ride. Okay, we're gonna start off in John chapter three. John chapter three, there's this guy called Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a religious leader. He's a highly respected religious leader. Historians tell us he is one of the few people in, in Israel at the time that is, he is like one of the top religious leaders, experts in the law. Highly respected. Knew the Bible. But he comes into contact with Jesus and Jesus' disciples. And there's something about Jesus and his disciples and he realizes they've got something he doesn't have. He realizes it. And maybe you've been like that. Maybe you've known about God and been in church and you maybe come into a church like this, come into our church and you're like, there's something different about those Christians. Like they've got something and they walk with God. There seems to be a joy, a, a bubble, a, a life that, that I don't have. And that's exactly what Nicodemus experienced. He's like, Jesus and his disciples have got something I don't have. So he humbles himself and he comes to Jesus and he asks them. And he asks Jesus this question. He says, now there was a man who was a Pharisee, a man called Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. 
he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi. Now, just that statement alone is profound because he was a rabbi. As a matter of fact, not only was, was Nicodemus a rabbi, rabbi means teacher, he was a rabbi of rabbis. In other words, he had rabbis underneath him. And he sees Jesus and he comes and he humbles himself and he says, Teacher, teach me. Teach me. And I think that's one of the keys for us to experience more of what God's got in our lives is we need to first humble ourselves and realize, hold on, there's more out there that I don't have. Let me humble myself. Let me put maybe some of my preconceived ideas about God and Christianity aside. And let me go and ask about that thing that they've got that I know I don't have. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born again when they are old? Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter into their mother's womb a second time to be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. You should not be surprised by me saying you must be born again. You must be born again. You must be born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. The Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. When Marinette and I were expecting our first child, Seth, we were living in Zambia as missionaries at the time, and we came down to to Bloemfontein because that's where um, she gave birth to our boys. Bloemfontein, hey, cheetahs. It's a good place. If you want your boys to grow up strong... So we came down there and we're excited and we'd just gone back, gone to, to the doctor to have a checkup and everything was good. And we went to the mall. And we're in the bookshop, both Marinette and I love books. I love reading. And so we're in the bookshop and I got two books under my arm. And she's there. Marinette also likes to joke. She likes to joke a lot. So she's there and we're in the we're in the in the in this bookstore and she says to me, she says, Paul, my water's just broken. I'm like, you're joking. I said, no, I'm not. I freaked out. I just ran out of the bookstore with the books under my arm, left Marinette in the bookstore. I don't know where I was running. I was just running. Eventually, I'm running. I'm like, ah! And we're like, whoa, whoa. Okay, books. I'm stealing books here. Let me go back and let me get Marinette. And we went to the hospital and Seth came into the world a few hours later. Amazing. Born of water talks about a natural birth. Each and every one of us have had a natural birth. All of us have been born into this world. We all have had a natural birth. But in order for us to enter the kingdom of God, we need to have a spiritual birth. There's another birth that we need to experience. And the reason for this is because back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they sinned and they died spiritually. And so they needed to have a rebirth. They needed to be revived. They needed to come alive again. But that was absolutely impossible until Jesus died on the cross. And he took death upon him and then he defeated death so that we could experience a rebirth and we could come alive spiritually. So that's what Jesus is saying to, to, to Nicodemus. You're dead spiritually. You need to come alive. You need to be reborn spiritually. You need to be reborn spiritually. Now this is amazing. And this is exactly what happened the very day Jesus rose from the grave. He came back to life. The first time he appeared to his disciples was a game changer for humanity. And it's one of these verses, these passages, that that it's so easy for us just to read over and not not to see the significance of what had actually just taken place. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to read it, and then we're going to just have a look deeper at the context of what it's actually saying. Are you with me? You're holding on to your chairs. Are you ready? Okay, John chapter 20, verse 19 and 20. Okay, this is the disciples. Jesus just risen, and, uh, and they're there waiting, and they, they heard that he's risen. They're scared. They're not sure. They're praying, and, and Jesus appears to them. On the very day that he rose, the first time he appears to him, it says this. He says, on the, very, on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed that they saw the Lord. And Jesus again said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he, are you ready? With that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Did you get that? With that, he breathed on them. Now, what's interesting is that phrase, with that, he breathed on them is this was written in, in Greek. The originally, the first time this was written and recorded in the book of John, it was written in Greek. And there is a Greek version of the Old Testament. And the very same phrase with that he breathed on them, that, that phrase of breathing, it's, it's not just a, <sighs> this is significant. It's, it indicates life. And the f- same phrase, is used in the book of Genesis chapter two. This is the part where you've got to hold on to your chair. The Lord formed man from the dust of the ground and he breathed, there it is, into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So in that moment when Jesus appeared to his disciples, he breathed on them and they experienced a rebirth. They were born of the Spirit. In the same way when when God breathed into Adam and he came alive spiritually, in the same way God breathed on the disciples and they experienced a coming alive. They were born again. They came alive spiritually. And if you've never experienced that, it is life-changing. The Bible describes it as, as taking out a heart of stone and replacing it with a heart of flesh. He changes you. You become a nicer person. And if you have experienced that, it doesn't make us better than people that haven't. It just makes us better than what we used to be. Like I'm, I'm a better person because God has changed me and I, I have a, a love for, I wanna do the right thing. I have a love for his word. I have a love for, for the things that he's concerned about. I'm a different person because I've experienced a rebirth experience. I get genetically rewired. I used to be destined to sin. Now I'm destined to do what's right. Reborn. My destiny gets altered. I go from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Another way to think about it is this, is before we, 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 we experience this, we are destined to lose. We might win occasionally, but we're destined to lose because death is in our future. Failure is in our future. Failure is who we are before we experience this. But when we experience and when we get born again, winning is in our future, we're destined to win. We might fail occasionally, but we're destined to win. Our destiny gets altered. It's a rebirth experience. It's amazing. And so this is exactly what the disciples had experienced. And then, and then, it doesn't end there. There is more. Everybody say there is more. There is more. So Jesus says to his disciples, okay, you've experienced this rebirth. Now what I want you to do is I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to wait there. And then you're gonna get empowered by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit had come to live inside of them. Then he tells them, and it's recorded in Acts chapter 1, verse eight and nine. He says, go and wait in Jerusalem and you're gonna receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you're gonna be changed. You're gonna be empowered. 
And so that's what they do. They go and they pray and they're waiting and they're praying and they're waiting. And Acts chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And they were all together constantly in prayer. And along with the woman and Mary and the mother of Jesus and with all the disciples, they're praying, they're waiting, they're praying, praying. And then the day of Pentecost comes, which is next Sunday. This coming Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. And it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, The sound like the blowing of a violent wind from heaven came and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that came and separated on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Wow. It was commotion. It was loud. It was noisy. Just imagine the emotional effect it had on them, weeping, crying, laughing, oh, oh, amazing. The people that came, the huge commotion came and, and the people from Jerusalem came and looked at them and looked at this, just what was going on. I thought, these people are drunk. Like what's going on? They're behaving like drunk people. But it, Peter, remember Peter, the guy that was so timid and, and denied Jesus three times, he's now been filled with the Holy Spirit. He's not not only been born again, he's now been baptized, empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's got this power to be a witness. And he stands up and he says, no, 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 we're not drunk. This is what was prophesied about by the prophet Joel. This is what he says in in Acts chapter two from verse verse 18. He says, these people are not drunk as you suppose. It is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken about by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour my spirit out on those days and they will prophesy. What a statement. In the Old Testament, when you read the Old Testament, you see, you notice that, that the Holy Spirit would come upon certain people and it was not available to everyone. You remember the story of Moses, for example, the power and the Holy Spirit came upon him and he was able to part the Red Sea, touch a rock and water would come out of it. All the plagues and everything else that happened through Moses. You look at David, look at Elijah, Elisha. There were certain Samson, there were certain times where the Holy Spirit would come upon people and they would be able to do things, incredible things, but it was, it was only for a select few. It wasn't available to everybody. And yet Joel says, a time is coming where, where this is not gonna be for one or two or if just for a select few. This is gonna be for everyone, including the person next to you. So just bang them again and say, this is for you. It's not, this is not for a select few. This is not for the chosen frozen or the spiritually weird. This is for everyone. It's for everyone. When you read the story of Jesus when he was on earth, one of the things that that you you, you see when you read what was happening and now he was living his life, you notice that he was going and the crowds would press against him. People were desperate for help. People were hurting, they were lonely, they were lost, they were hopeless, they were in desperate situations. Think about the lepers, desperate for healing. Crying, pressing against them. Think about the lady with the issue of blood. So if I can just touch the hem of his garment, trying to press through the crowd to get to him. And Jesus, knowing all of this, the Bible says that he was overwhelmed. He was overwhelmed by the need. There's one time where actually he's looking over the city and he starts to cry, starts to weep because he knows that that there's so many people that are in desperate, desperate need. You know, the the truth is that today there are so many people that are in desperate, desperate need. People are helpless. They feel helpless. They feel lost. They feel like they're drowning. They just need, they need a miracle. They need a breakthrough. They need something to happen in their situation. And Jesus saw all of that and he sees all of that. And so he makes a statement while he's on earth. He makes a statement, he said, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it will remain a single seed. The Bible describes Jesus while he was on earth as Jesus, the anointed one. Christ, which means the anointed one. The one that the Holy Spirit was on. 
And he says, unless a seed of gra- seed falls to the ground and dies, it will remain a single seed. But if it falls to the ground and dies, it will produce a great harvest. What? You'll go from one seed to many seeds. And so that's exactly Jesus' intention. Jesus died not only so that you and I could be born again and experience rebirth, but he died to reproduce himself in you. And that's why Jesus says to his disciples, you will do greater miracles than me. Now, I don't know about you, but I read that and think, what? Like, how is that even possible? But the reality is that that is God's intention for your life, that God would use you to to a greater degree than what Jesus was used while he was on earth. That it would go from one Jesus to many Jesuses. That you would be Christ on earth. That's one of the reasons why why the early Christians actually got the name Christian, which means little Christ, little anointed one. Because the people that were looking at this, they realized he's just like Jesus. Like wherever he goes, miracles happen. Like life is changing. Why? Because these people, not only did they experience a second birth, not only did they get born again, but then they experienced an empowering of the Holy Spirit. They were baptized in power of the Holy Spirit and they began to change the world. Many of us experience that personally. We're starting to see glimpses of that. We're seeing pockets of that. But I don't know about you, but I, I, want, to see, I want to see our world changed. Like completely. I want a, a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I want to experience more of God because there is more. Now even these Christians, these people that experience this, Acts chapter two, wow. Go on to Acts chapter three. Peter makes a statement, he says, and we can expect times of refreshing to come from the Lord. So even though they experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they, you, we can experience times of refreshing on top of that. And that's exactly what they experienced in Acts chapter four, the very next chapter. The same group of people, these disciples, they're praying together once again. And this is what it says in Acts chapter four. Acts chapter four, verse 31. It says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all. Everybody say all. All. Not for a select few. All filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All. No matter where you are in your journey with God, there is always more. There is always more of God that's available to you and I. And God wants us to experience more and more and more of him. Good news is that this coming Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Not this Thursday, next Thursday, the 27th, we're gonna have a baptism in the Holy Spirit service here at church. 6.30, it's gonna be amazing. If you've got questions, you need to come along to that. If you wanna be prayed for, if you wanna experience this, come along. It's for everyone. There's more. God wants to not only change us to experience a second birth and go to heaven, but He wants to use us to change our world. Our world is in desperate need. We need His power. We need His wisdom. People need healing. They need a touch from God. And God wants to use us to bring that change into our world. And what He wants is He wants us to say, here I am, Lord, use me. Here I am, Lord, use me, use me, use me. Can I ask you to stand with me to your feet? There is more. There's always more for us as Christians because God is unlimited. Doesn't matter how much we've experienced, there is always more. If you like Nicodemus, might know a lot about God. Maybe you've been serving God your whole life, but, but you haven't experienced that second birth, that born again experience. There's more. And the way that we experience that is by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, by inviting Him into our hearts and, and He re- takes out a heart of flesh and He replaces it with a, so He takes out a heart of stone and He replaces it with a heart of flesh and we experience that. We get reborn, we get born of the Spirit. Amazing, life-changing. But maybe you have experienced that. Maybe you're born again. But just like what happened with the disciples in, in John chapter 20, 
They experienced that was amazing, but there was more. There was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So in John chapter 20, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of them. But then in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they got empowered by the Holy Spirit. There is more. And even those that got empowered by the Holy Spirit, they had times of refreshing. Where they just got filled up again. There is more. There is more. There is more. And our world needs to experience us experiencing more of Him. So I'm going to ask you, would you close your eyes? Just pray right now and say, God, I want more of you. I want more of you, Jesus. I need more of you, Lord. While every person's eyes close and heads are bowed, I want to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and to be born again. It's not weird. It's a very simple thing where you just, you pray and you, you surrender your life to God. You're asking for forgiveness. And if you do that, the Bible actually says that He comes to live inside of you and He changes you. His Spirit lives inside of you. And while every head is bowed, while every eye is closed, if that's you, I'd love to lead you in a very simple prayer. Could you just quickly raise your hand so I don't know who I'm praying with? You say, yes, that's me. That's brilliant. Anybody else? Well done. Well done. Best decision you can ever make. Well done. You can put your hands down. I'm going to say a very simple prayer. I'm going to ask the rest of the congregation to pray along with me, but in particular, those that raise their hands. Just repeat this prayer after me. Say this, Lord Jesus, today I give my life to you. Forgive me for my sins, Lord. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Come and live inside of me, Jesus, and change me from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching our YouTube channel. We really pray that you find it helpful in your journey. And we also really want to encourage you to take your next step by signing up to join a small group or to do discovery. Thanks again for watching and don't forget to subscribe and share this with as many people as possible. And we really can't wait to see you next Sunday.